that you uh, raised. One of them is you asked about meditation before, and, and it relates very nice to this. Uh, at some point, uh, maybe five, seven years ago, I was interested in, uh, in uh, meditation because we study something, and this will be my second point, uh, we study mind wandering. What happens when, when the brain just uh, goes somewhere else? So I decided to take this uh, mindfulness uh, um, uh, workshop in Worcester where it was invented inve by John Kabat-Zinn. And I decided to go and just uh, immerse in the experience and not be a scientist when I'm there and just you know, let them teach me what they do. If I don't like it at the end, I just won't play with this. But, but I'm just going to listen to them and not be critical, just uh, suspend this belief. And on the first, you know, the second sentence of the first lesson, she said, we're going to teach you uh, diffused attention, which is for a scientist like an oxymoron because uh, attention is a spotlight. That's how you learn about this in graduate school. It's really a spotlight that takes you to points of interest in your scene or, in, or anywhere in your environment. And now she talks about diffused attention. So I already uh, knew it's going to be entertaining for me. But, uh, but after a while, I realized actually that, that they're ahead of, uh, of, um, of our understanding in a sense that it is possible. And part of the things that they accomplish with the proper meditation is the fact that you, in a way, the way I look at it in my terminology of top-down and expectations, they just quiet down these expectations. So you, you let everything come into you without any, they call it judgment, but you know, we call it uh, uh, more expectations or predictions and, and, and use your memory. So I guess they use less of their memory in, in when they're meditating and just, uh, and it's not only, I think it changes the way they are and the way they think. So it's not only when they meditate that they become more fully aware of their environment and, and are able to, to be talking here but, but noticing the lights and noticing the reflections and, and, and uh, etc. So, uh, so I think that could be actually w what you're getting at and maybe there is uh, other way than just reminding yourself that could be another type of meditation, but uh, they are striving for it and, and I wonder if their memory is, is, uh, is better than others. Um, yeah, and the second thing, it's not completely related, so uh, I don't have to say it, but uh, okay. But uh, people call it my mind wandering and I remember I had a postdoc once uh, she's actually a professor at Columbia now, but uh, uh, she kept talking about mind wandering. And with my limited English, I said, you know, wandering sounds aimless to me. And I don't think the brain does anything aimless because as Josh, uh, the neuroscientist, talked about the energy that the brain takes. And, and, I, and, and, and I, uh, these are exactly uh, the things that we've been thinking about. Um, it's like, why would the brain do something so aimless if it takes so much energy? And, and think about the function of mind wandering. And again, it sounds like an oxymoron in the sense that mind wandering is idle, right? We don't, so the brain apparently doesn't go to sleep when you're not doing anything. When you're stuck in traffic, when you're in the shower, as we all know, we don't turn off the brain and wake it up again when we need to. But rather, the brain is very active. And if, in fact, if you look at these nice, colorful brains that come from MRI, from functional MRI, of brains at rest, uh, you'll see that they're vigorously active. There's a giant network of, of things that patient subjects do when they lie in the magnet when you're not asking them to do anything. So usually you give them a block of trials, they do things that are pretty intense, and then you tell them, you know, wait for 10 minutes until we start the next one, or two minutes, or half a minute. And it turns out that all these rest periods are extremely active, and it made us think, you know, what do people do when they don't do anything, when, when they mind wander elsewhere when there is a boring uh, lecture. And it turns out, as just to go back to this idea of memory as, as, a, as a, a vehicle to help us prepare, one way that we accumulate this memory, obviously, is with experience, right? We have to go through things. We fall from the bicycle for the first time. Well, uh, uh, we scratch our knees, it, it's, it's, it stays in our memory and it makes us more careful next time. But our beautiful, beautifully powerful uh, brains uh, can actually simulate also these experiences, right? So we don't have to go through, every, if I tell you, and that's a, a, an example from my, my good colleague Dan Gilbert, uh, if I tell you, uh, would you like to try an ice cream, uh, you know, an avocado and sardines ice cream? You don't have to taste it to say, oh, no, I don't want it. You just simulate and you understand that that's an experience you don't want to go through, even though you haven't experienced it, right? So we don't have to go through everything in order to, to remember it. We can make these simulations. So mind wandering, one of the main purposes is to create what we call memories because they're not really, they haven't been experienced, but they've been mentally experienced. 
and we don't just discard the result of this mind wandering, we store it in memory just like, like any experienced memories and they become as powerful in our preparation for the future in terms of we can access and pull the results of these simulations. Oh, just a pause for a moment. If anybody has cards, if you just want to pass them to the aisles and somebody will collect them. Well, sure, how about do we know about the way children remember? And is that markedly different than adults? Well, I'm, I'm not sure we know much about how different they are in the way they remember. Um, we do see, as people who have uh, young kids at home, uh, it's very interesting to see how the, whole, the entire world is interesting for them. Everything is new. And it's pretty depressing to think that in our everyday life, and, and you know, since you're maybe 12, uh, things are repeating. It's, it's very rare. When was the last time uh, you encountered something that's completely new? Right? I mean, even these goggles where, where uh, 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 people have been talking about them, but, but you know, we, we know that uh, everything around us is related to something else, or it looks like something else, or behaves like something else. So uh, it's a little depressing to realize that our environment doesn't consist of much novelty, and most of the things are, are almost familiar to us. And, yeah, I mean, just this makes me come back to the original question you asked me of, like, how do you live your life differently? and uh, what Moshe was talking about earlier, which is the importance of novelty. And we know that novel experiences are more memorable, and the question is how do we make, put ourselves in the way of more novel experiences? How do we make sure that we're doing things that are new, that are different, that are gonna be memorable? I think that's a worthwhile thing to have in the front of your mind as you move through the world. What am I doing today that is gonna be different from what I did yesterday or the day before or the day before, and therefore, more memorable.